Our goal for today is to talk about area when we're doing polar coordinates. Now we've dealt with area before. It's one of the first things we learned to do with integration, right? We said, oh, we take our, our shape and we break things up into rectangles. Well, rectangles make a lot of sense when you think about area in Cartesian coordinates because rectangles are sort of a natural way because you have some change in X and some change in Y. We're switching to polar. And so we're not going to be based on rectangles. We're going to be based on something else. So it's going to be a little bit interesting. Let's begin. So our basic underlying shape is not a rectangle. It's a pie slice. Well, or pizza slice, whatever you want to call it. Whatever your favorite round thing is that you cut something out from the center. Now, why does this make sense in terms of our basic shape? Well, we think about there's sort of two things that you can perturb. One is your angle and the other is your radius. And so you want to say, okay, let's let our angle vary. Let's let our radius vary. And so we see, okay, when we do that, we get a shape that has this sort of configuration. Now, we need to understand what's the area of one of these pie slices, because that's what we're going to build off of. And it's actually pretty straightforward. We say, okay, well, let's think of it as how much of the circle are we using up? Well, we can take the area we want divided by pi r squared. Think of that as like a percentage, the percent of the circle that the area currently contains. That's going to match the percent that we swing around. So in other words, if we think of this angle here as delta theta, and instead of theta, like a small change in theta, so we can even throw it here as delta theta, then what we have is that this angle compared to the whole way around is the small change in the angle over 2 pi. Well, multiply through by pi r squared, and we get that the area is 1 half radius squared times the change in our angle. Now, one way to see that this makes sense is to think about, well, okay, if I have an area, I should have two measurements of distance involved. You know, like length times width, that's two distances. And here, the change in theta is not a distance measurement. But the r squared, that's two distances, right? Because we square it. So it does make sense as a distance measurement. At least the units would work out appropriately. Now we have our idea. We say, okay, so suppose we have this curve. And we say this is the curve. We want to find the area. Here's our r equals f of theta. And we break things up into slices. Now when we had y equals f of x, how did we break things up? Well, the idea is we'd say, well, if we have y equals f of x, we would break things up by saying, let's break our input into small pieces. So in other words, we're breaking our x into small parts and seeing what do we get. Here, when we think of r as a function of theta, what we'll do is we'll break our theta up into small parts. And so we can say, look, we're going to take our, our shape and we're going to break theta into small pieces. It's the equivalent of what we're doing over here, where we break things up into parts. Now we broke our angle up into small parts. And we say for each little piece, let's approximate it by wedge. And so we have for this shape here, we've taken six wedges. And we said, well, let's just sort of go out roughly where we are. Now you might say, that doesn't look too great as approximations go. But we haven't used very many wedges. And the thing is, the more wedges you use, the better the approximation gets. That's sort of the underlying idea of integration, right? The more pieces you use, the smaller the individual pieces become, the smaller your error becomes and so the better your answer becomes okay all right so we do what we always do we say look for a better approximation use more slices here we're doing the same thing it's the same curve it's this dotted curve here all we've done is greatly increase the number of slices that we use and you can see that the difference is now pretty small so in other words if you add up the the pie slices up versus the area, it's not very different. And you can imagine as we go further and further through our approximation, we get better and better. So we have the following. Our area 
is approximately found when we add things up, and that's what our, our capital sigma means, add things up, one half r squared and then your angle, delta theta, right? So this is, this is the area of one slice, one pi slice. So what does this become? Well, it becomes adding up starting angle to finishing angle, one half function squared d theta. And so the key here, this one half r squared, right? That's what that f of theta is. That's r, so r squared. And so if you can remember, you know, what's the area of a pi slice, then you say, hey, that's great, because that just tells me what I'm adding up. You know, I'm adding these little pieces up here. Okay, so it's lots of little areas being added together. Now, what do we need to look for? Well, we need to focus on a couple of things. First off, finding the correct angles. And that is, where do we start and stop? So oftentimes, we aren't told where to start and stop, so we have to figure it out. So we have to figure out where alpha and beta are. Well, for that, we can use symmetry, and uh, that can help us. By the way, symmetry is a great way to simplify. It, it can re reduce the work. So whenever you see a mathematician pull out the word symmetry, that's a way of saying, I want to make things easier on myself because I'm going to say, look, I could do it four times, but each time I'd get the same answer. So I'm just going to do it once and multiply by four. So that's what symmetry means. It's really about reducing the work. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that when we talk about finding our angles, if when in doubt, what should you do? Well, oftentimes you're going to cue off of when do you hit the center. So in other words, another thing to look for is when does your function equal zero? So that can help you figure out what the right angles to use are. Now there's another note here, power reduction identities. You can imagine that a lot of curves that we encounter in polar coordinates are described using trigonometric functions. And as a consequence, there's a lot of trigonometry involved. So it's a good time to recall that there are six trig identities which you should know to get you through calculus. And if you don't know what they are, we're going to talk about them because we don't want to go through them every single time we do a problem today. So we're just going to go through them once right now and then just sort of pull them out as if by magic later on. So what are the six? Well, you have sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. And you're like, wow, I know that one. Really? That's one of the six? Yeah, it is. Like, wow, this is great. I'm one sixth of the way there. In fact, the next one follows from this one almost immediately. Divide by cosine squared and you're going to get tangent squared because sine over cosine is tangent. You'll get one. And then here you get secant squared. That's actually number two. We're already a third of the way done and it feels like we've only, you know, we hit things that we already know. This is great, wonderful. Okay, so what's next? Tell me more. I'm getting excited here. Okay, all right. The next two are double angle identities. Okay, so the first one, double angle identity for sine. Sine of two theta is two sine theta cosine theta. All right, and then of course we should do one, one for cosine and cosine two theta. There's a lot of ways to write this one. So I'll just write the one that is sort of very generic. It's cosine squared minus sine squared. Now the reason I say there's a lot of ways to rewrite it is you can say, hey, I can do things, for example, replace cosine squared by one minus sine squared. So you can rewrite this as one minus two sine squared as an example. But oftentimes it's sufficient to remember cosine squared minus sine squared. Okay, those are our next two. We're now got four out of six. What? Really? That's it? Cool, I can do that. Now, the last two, those are the power reduction ones. And there's kind of a hint here. What power reduction says is you have a power and you want to reduction it. In other words, make it smaller. So how do we do it? Well, it's actually, look here, the cosine two theta, right there. Do you see it? Do you see it? It's a 
second degree, but there it's a first degree. Ah, so somehow it's going from that side to that side. And so if you actually combine this first identity, Pythagorean identity, double angle formula for cosine, and some rearranging, you get the following two facts. And these are ones we'll use quite frequently. Cosine squared is 1 plus cosine 2 theta over 2, and sine squared is 1 minus cosine 2 theta over 2. Of course, you can see if you add cosine squared plus sine squared, the cosine 2 theta is cancel, you end up with 1. That's a good check because, well, it should be true, right? Yeah, it should be true. And those are the six trig identities that you need to know to get through calculus. And we'll probably use a couple of them uh, as we go through and do these problems. Now, one last thing to talk about. Okay, and that is, what if we have something between two curves? Well, what do we mean there? Well, for that, what you should think of is you, you have your coordinate system, and then you have some outside curve. So in other words, one that's further away. So maybe we'll call this one r equals f of theta. And then you have some inside curve, something that's closer. You know, you might have r equals g of theta. And you want to find some area in between. And so, for instance, you, you might have something like the following picture, and you're asked to find the area, let's say it's this part right here. All right, so what do you do? Well, the answer is, of course, is you subtract out. So this is oftentimes the way we think of it, right? So if you go back to things such as uh, the washer method, where you said, look, you have the big circle minus the little circle. Well, that's the same philosophy. We're gonna take the big minus the little. And so, what you're going to have is you're going to have the angles. Now, now, how do you find the angles? So, either they're given to you, or if they're not, you look for intersection points. Now, remember, we're in polar coordinates. So, it's not in terms of x, it's not in terms of y, it's in terms of an angle. So, what you do is you, you say, for which angle do they intersect? Well, you set f of theta equal g of theta, solve, and that's how you find the intersection. And uh, when in doubt, just guess. Oftentimes you'll be surprised, a good guess will get you pretty far. Now, last thing I want to say is, how do we know which one is the outer curve and which one is the inner curve? And we're going to go through this as we do examples, but I think the important thing to remember is think about how polar coordinates are set up. We always relate to the middle. So if I'm trying to figure out, okay, which one's the outside curve, which one's the inside curve, I do the following, is I start at my center. Uh, you can think of this, this is the pole and polar, and I just move out. Whatever curve I hit first, that's my inner, and then I have a little stretch where I'm hitting, and whichever curve I hit second, that's my outer. So this would be, outer curve would be f, inner curve would be g, which is why it's set up one half, outer function squared minus inner function squared. Big area minus little area. And there we go. And actually, it's not so bad. The main idea, remember to square your function, don't forget the half. A lot of people forget the half. That's a common mistake. So we're not going to get your bounds, do trig identities, Life is good. Life is good. Well, I think it's time for us to go and do some practice. See you soon.